Good morning, and thanks for joining us through YouTube. We are from two churches, St. Paul's and St. Thomas and St. Andrew Doxy. As part of the Church of England here in Stafford, we are delighted to be able to share together in praise and worship during these difficult times. Much of the service follows the words that, you've been, that have been sent out to the members of the two churches, but if you don't have, have them, then please don't worry, as the message is the same. We as Christians follow the way, the truth and the life that was shown to us by Jesus Christ, the Son of God and our Saviour. I would like to thank all those from both our churches who are contributing to this service this morning. Those reading, those leading the worship, the Reverend Bill Mash for his reflection and our intercessor, our vicar, the Reverend Martin Strang, and our curate, the Reverend Alison Thomas, who has helped in compiling this YouTube video. So we have gathered to worship God. Let us worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Join together with me in our opening prayer. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we're here to worship, we're ready, and we're going to join together in a song, Here I Am to Worship. And I thank Anne Whittington for leading us in this opening song. Oh 
prayer of the day, the Collect, is for the eighth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of God, now and forever. Amen. We come to a time when we say sorry to God. During the past few days, there will, will have been times when we have fallen short of God's expectations. But he is a willing and loving God, keen to hear us and forgive us when we say sorry. Please say together the words in bold. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us for behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us, for failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us, for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed. Forgive us our sins. Open our eyes to God's truth. Strengthen us to do God's will and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join together, recognizing the wonderful nature of our God. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We dwell in him and he in us. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him and speak of all his marvellous works. Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. So let's do that by joining together in the hymn, Tell Out My Soul led by Tony Murley and our virtual choir. Sure, 
from age to age the same. His holy name, the Lord, the mighty one. Tell out my soul the greatness of his might, as and do. Let's listen to the Word of God. We have two words from the Bible this morning which follow on from each other. The first is from Romans, read by Jenny Mash, and the second from the Gospel of St Luke, read by Karen Perry. Thank you to both. After the readings, we'll hear from the Reverend Bill Mash reflecting on these readings and continuing on from what he wrote in our newsletter just over a week ago. Our New Testament reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. Present suffering and future glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they have already? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning's Gospel reading is from Luke 13, reading from 1 to 5. Repent or perish. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all other living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I always wonder who might stumble across these services that we're recording. So just to set the record straight, my name's Bill Mash and I am not the vicar or either of the curates. I'm a retired workplace chaplain from the Black Country, now living near Stafford. Well, one day, unless Jesus returns, historians will write about the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 in history books. In the same way that today they write about the Black Death or the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918. Scientists in the future will be amazed at a virus particle so small that you could line up 10,000 of them between the millimetre marks on a ruler could devastate lives, societies, families, economies. But right now, you and I are living through it. If humanity does find a way to defeat this tiny virus, it'll be thanks to the efforts of medical scientists and researchers, people like Professor Sarah Gilbert heading up the team in Oxford. She and many others are working hard to understand the coronavirus and the human immune system, and they may well be on track to produce a safe vaccine in world record time. Other people are looking at different drugs which can reduce the effects of the virus and give people a better chance of getting through it without severe effects. There's another way of trying to understand this, and it's the age-old question that comes to people of faith. Where is God in all this? Or why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to the people I love? Why is this happening to our society today? These questions confront us forcibly when our lives are disrupted, when we find ourselves vulnerable or uncertain. Each of us will have had our own personal crises and difficulties in life. Times when we've asked God where he is or why something is happening. But recent months have seen us all as individuals, as families, as communities, caught up in a shared experience, one that's challenged us all in so many ways. We ask where God is because we believe he does have a purpose for this and we genuinely want to understand and trace what he's doing. That question doesn't even arise for people who don't have faith, though strangely the idea that bad behaviour leads to some sort of punishment, lurks in the irrational superstitions that many people hold on to. People want to see some purpose in life, but it's difficult because this pandemic seems quite random. We don't know why one person catches it and another doesn't, or apparently you can have it and not even know that you've got it. Marathon runners in their 20s catch it and die. 90-year-olds get it and survive. Some people will answer this question by taking Bible verses out of context and trying to draw a straight line between sin and suffering, whether it's for an individual or for a community. There's plenty in the prophets like Amos to dis suggest that disasters, famines and plagues are the result of God's judgment. If God punishes iniquity and sin by sending these things, then at least we know where we stand. 
at the time of the Black Death. There was no shortage of people condemning wickedness and calling for repentance. Going back to the Bible, that was the line taken by Job's friends when they gathered round him in his suffering. He must have done something wrong, they said. He wasn't quite as righteous as he seemed, and he needed to repent. Now, the book of Job is not easy to understand. But as it comes to a conclusion, it brings the clear message that Job was not to blame for his suffering and that we should never blame someone for their suffering. God doesn't work in that sort of simple way. But it's a very persistent idea. And let's be honest, we've all thought it at one time or another. People thought like that in Jesus' day. In that reading from Luke chapter 13, Jesus is asked about people killed in an act of gratuitous violence by the Roman governor. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in that way? He answers, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus goes on to talk about an item that was on the news in those days. People have been killed when a tower fell on them. Again, he's emphatic. I tell you, no. He's clear that no line can be drawn between the individual sin and suffering. His world appeared as random as ours, and his call to people of his day, caught up together in a shared experience, was to repent and to turn to God. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. In John's Gospel, Jesus comes across a man who'd been blind from birth. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replies, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed. Now, I'm not for one moment going to contradict the Old Testament when it says that God does use suffering, disasters and plagues to shape his people and to guide history. These things are part of the world we live in and nothing is outside God's control. The reading from Paul's letter to the Romans talks of creation being subjected to frustration or futility. But it isn't a random hopeless chaos. It is subjected in hope. There's a purpose in what God is doing. And as his followers, we are quite right to try and understand it. The ultimate hope is that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. God began that liberation in Old Testament times. He needed to form a nation and a community that would represent him on earth and bring about his purposes. It needed great and traumatic events, plagues sometimes, to bring that nation to a point where he could come, as one of them, into his world. That's what happened when Jesus came to the world. God's purpose is to liberate his creation, took a huge step forward. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God, the rule of God, which would one day bring the frustration and groaning to an end. He came to form a new people who would represent him on earth, you and me, Christians, the church. And the key to it all was repentance. It's about being sorry for our sins, yes, but it's more about realigning our lives, choosing to be part of what God is doing in his world, going along with his purposes as we understand them. When Paul writes, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, it could equally well be, we know that in all things God works for good with those who love him. That call to repent comes to us today. And the God to whom we turn is the God who revealed himself to us in Jesus. Jesus said that to have seen him was to have seen the Father. When we realign our lives, we have the pattern 
example and teaching of Jesus. The Bible itself may be hard to understand, but Jesus helps us to read it as a whole rather than taking verses out of context. He is in the middle and we work backwards, perhaps beginning to understand God's purpose in the Old Testament through him. And we work forwards from him to understand the Christian life. He doesn't give us carefully worked out answers to the questions we ask. Rather, he comes alongside us and shares in the crises of life. In the Gospel, we see the God who comes to share and bear the pain himself. The God who weeps at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Ultimately, this God would face the evil of the world and die upon the cross. The Dutch priest and writer, theologian Henry Nguyen wrote, Now we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us. We find it is often those who, instead of giving advice, solutions or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. If God is like Jesus, then the answer to the question, where is God in this, is that he is on the front line, there with the carers, the doctors, the medical scientists, taking risks, facing danger, searching for knowledge. We may not feel that we are at all special like Professor Gilbert, but as his people, you and me, as we live through this, we are all in situations where we can help others and bring the love and presence of Jesus to them, sharing their pain and touching their wounds with a warm and tender hand. In all things, God works for good with those who love him. Historians have suggested that a terrible plague in the second century, which might have killed off a quarter of the people in the Roman Empire, led to the spread of Christianity, as Christians stayed in the cities to care for the sick. They began to understand that plagues were not the result of the work of an angry deity, but the product of a broken creation, groaning in revolt against a loving God. Well, you and I won't be mentioned in history books in years to come, but historians might just record that people phoned their friends or sent letters and emails to encourage someone. They'll remember that some people went out and did shopping for others or picked up prescriptions or baked a cake. They will remember care workers who sat alongside the dying, as well as the researchers who produced a vaccine. In all things, God works for good with those who love him. That's where God is in all this. Well, thanks, Bill, for your thoughts and your help with us considering these readings this morning. I've been thinking how useful it is to have uh, services on YouTube. It's always quite useful to be able to go back if there's something you haven't quite heard right or want to check up on again. And thanks again, Bill. Let us join together in affirming our faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Throughout our time here on earth, we need to approach our God 
recognizing the weaknesses we have and asking for his power to support us through his grace. Let's join together again in worship, this time led by John Wyatt, worship minister at St John's Hoxton in London. And after this song, we will be led by Ian Perry in our prayers.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of creation. We thank you for the bird song that fills the air. We thank you for the cry of a newborn baby. We thank you for summer sun and also rain that feeds the earth. We thank you for your church. And we think especially of the churches where we worship here in Stafford, St. Paul's, and also St. Thomas and St. Andrew's in Doxy. Lord, we pray for the children and the parents who are beginning their summer holidays. And we pray that they spend this time resting and relaxing before they have to begin to think about school and how it might reopen again in September. Lord, we also pray for our vicar, vicar Martin, as he too spends a time of rest and relaxation after what has been a very stressful and busy year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us, Lord, as we live in your world. The hungry faces stare at us through the television screens. The squatting figure on the pavement asks for money. We turn away, preferring not to see, preferring not to remember our common humanity. or the link between our plenty and their poverty. Forgive us, Lord, that we can live so easily with the needs of others. Forgive us, Lord, as we live in your church. The people sitting near us come with tears in their eyes and unhealed wounds in their lives. We turn away preferring not to see, preferring not to remember our common belonging together in Christ, or the link between our spiritual well-being and theirs. Forgive us, Lord, that we can live so easily with our friends' needs. Forgive us, Lord, as we live out our own lives. We try to give the impression of personal health, fearing that weakness will be interpreted as failure. We turn away, preferring not to see, preferring not to remember that we too need healing and the link between our well being and your forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord, that we can live so easily with our own needs. Amen. Lord Jesus, you committed yourself to a world which needed you, yet rejected you. We commit ourselves, all that we are and all that we have, to a world that you still love, believing that in doing so, we are committing ourselves to you. Amen. God be with us in our reality. Christ be with us in our adversity. 
Spirit be with us in our perplexity. And may we all be with each other in solidarity. Amen. As we thirst for God in our lives, let us pray to him now. Father, we thirst for you and your meaning and your guidance in all our work and worship and praise. Fill us so full with your spirit that those we meet are drawn to you. When I say living spirit of God, would you please respond with quench our thirst? Living Spirit of God, quench our thirst. Father, in all the corruption and double standards which damage and unnerve our world, we thirst for your Spirit of truth, purity and goodness. Living Spirit of God, quench our thirst. Father, we thirst for your spirit of love, which notices needs, considers no job beneath itself, and delights in each person's gifts. Living Spirit of God, quench our thirst. Father, we thirst for your spirit of compassion, which binds up wounds, supports the nervous and frail, and visits the imprisoned and afraid. Living Spirit of God, quench our thirst. Father, we thirst for your spirit of life, as we call to mind those who have come to the point of earthly death. May they and we in our turn find eternal refreshment and peace with you. Living Spirit of God, quench our thirst. Father, may we thank you with all our lives, as well as our lips, for the constant outpouring of your Spirit to us throughout our lives. Amen. Bringing our prayers together, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Going out to serve God. During these long weeks of lockdown and now slow release, we have been serving God in many ways, perhaps through Pilgrim, through In It Together, uh, Zoom services, and YouTube, our support of House of Bread, our Buddy and Link systems. There have been many acts of kindness, encouragement through this time, and we are called to go out and to serve God. So let's join together in singing, Ye Servants of God.
As we come to the end of this service for all God's family, I'd like to thank again all those who have contributed and also all of you for joining us. I wish you the very best for the week ahead. I ask you to join with me in a closing prayer. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, Help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now imagine you are standing before the cross and actively consider each of the first three parts of this next piece by throwing those things at the cross and then raising our hands to heaven as we set our hopes on Christ. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All our hopes we set on the risen Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.